ha grabado más de 120 discos. Esta noche, el sueño del maestro Tito Puente y la Orquesta Sinfónica de Puerto Rico. First time I, I heard Tito was uh, he knocked on my door and uh, he came to the house and it went. And I said, who that? And I opened the door, it was him. Tito's presence inspired us all, you know. Staying true to yourself is the most important thing an artist can do. And that's what he's promoted uh, by his appearances and by his recordings throughout the years. And I, and I think that that's what, that's, that's what makes him Tito Puente. Tito Puente's life and times and career are a metaphor for the Latin experience in the United States. Everything he wrote instills the world to dance. And the essence of the man is that inside of him, as a timbalist and as a composer and as an arranger, is a dancer. To this day, I believe I'm my father's biggest fan. I really and truly love my father's music. He is, in my community, a giant. He is what we've always called him a rey. He is a king. You can see by looking at him that he's, he's uh, entirely committed to what they call in Spanish, una entrega total. to pay tribute to Tito when he passed away. And Tito was always like the king of the little man. In other words, Tito uh, felt more comfortable in El Barrio in the South Bronx, and he never forgot his roots. Tito, 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 Tito. My dad was out there. He was a man of the streets, so to speak. He liked to be among the people. He liked to be playing and working. In his mind, that was paying your dues. Dad always used to love being on stage. We'd go into these little small clubs and it'd be a little three-piece or a quartet performing, and he would just go up there and, and just jam out with them. I mean, the carga, I'm talking about for 20 minutes. I never forgot the street. The mass of people are in the streets, and they love a, a good rhythmic type of music. On August 20, 2000, the community which Tito Puente called home honored him by renaming New York City's East 110th Street Tito Puente Way. I knew my dad was big, but I didn't know he was this big. And what really brought that point home was after he passed on. It was a very emotional day for, for many of his friends and, and particularly his family. Um, it was an incredible experience. We were able to visit the apartment that he lived in for many years. We were able to stand in his bedroom. Um, I couldn't help but imagine uh, him running down the hallways and down the steps uh, into 110th Street. And that's always how he identified himself. So uh, it was incredible that we can have a small part in giving that back to him and having his name uh, emblazoned on the streets of, uh, of the five blocks of 110th Street. It was incredible to, to be part of that day to stand there and watch them unveil a street name that meant so much to him. Whenever people would ask him where he came from, he would say 110th Street. I want to thank, from the mayor on down, Giuliani, who signed the bill a couple of weeks ago, to Congressman Reed, his staff, and everybody else. On behalf of my father, we thank you. 
The Puente family and thousands of his fans celebrated the memory of this man who referred to himself as simply a street musician. With music, of course. The Tito Puente Orquesta! El Barrio in New York City, home to millions of Puerto Rican immigrants and cultural capital of Latin music in the U.S. This is where it all began. Traditional rhythms and beats were transformed here by new experiences and a unique body of music was created. This building on 110th Street between Madison and Park Avenues is the place the Puente family called home. Tito grew up in this neighborhood. It is here that he developed his passion for music. He often referred to his music as street music because it was the music that everyday people loved to dance to. You can hear his classic arrangements and compositions throughout this community and internationally. Tito continues to be an ambassador connecting this community with the rest of the world. My name is Audrey Puente, and this is my father's story. East Harlem, as it was called, wasn't called Spanish Harlem, it was East Harlem. It was very Italian, very Jewish. The original uh, Puerto Rican settlers are uh, immigrants from Puerto Rico, at my folks also, they came in the, in the mid-twenties, and they settled into that part of our Spanish Harlem, or East Harlem, from Lexington Avenue westward toward Central Park, toward, toward Fifth Avenue. And uh, that became what they call uh, La Colonia, El, El Barrio. Yeah. And that's where Tito was born. He was for first contact like with anybody else growing up in the year, the late 20s and, and, and 30s, was the radio. Music becomes very important during the Depression because the record industry is already, is already a, a, a big industry. So people can't really probably afford to go to the clubs and all that, things are very bad, but they will always have a couple of centavos, even though records cost a dollar even then to have the records and the party at home. Tito was into music, but he was much more hearing music from Cuba. Don't forget, Cuba was open to us. So those who had radios, we would get transmissions from Cuba. We had music from Puerto Rico. Not only that, what your parents brought, the records that your parents brought. <laughs> Well, the roots and the culture comes right from here. And we're here at the Plaza San Jose in Old San Juan. A lot of music came out of this area, naturally, and I was very fortunate through my parents, of course, to learn about the music. Listening to all those trios and bombas and planas when I was a young kid. <laughs> Today, they, the marketing term is salsa, but in the 50s, they called it mambo. And uh, it's definitely Afro-Cuban roots. Tito says, uh, the only salsa that I know comes out of a bottle, you know, because uh, the music I'm playing is the music I've played since I started playing this music, and, and it's Cuban music. Um, naturally, when you play Cuban music and you're outside of Cuba, and of course uh, Tito Puente is, the, you know, of Puerto Rican parents and born in New York, the music takes on other characteristics. But, but the struggle is to keep it as 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 close to that original thing that you're that you're trying to impart, you know, to that original feeling. And uh, Tito has always been true to that. Tito Puente has ha been a friend of, of the Cuban music for all his life. He's part of us too. 
Tito is, is not only a, a very uh, prominent Puerto Rican person, but he is also like an honorary member of the, uh, of the Cuban community, you know. All of the cool cats, Eddie Palmieri, you know, all the cats, they play things, you know. But Tito hits things. They call me a street musician. I used to be called that years ago because of the percussion that I played. Your heart has rhythm, everything has rhythm. All life, everything is rhythm in life. And percussion is the basic thing for our music. That's why people love our Latin American rhythms because they have that wonderful percussive feeling where they feel like dancing and enjoying themselves and be happy all the time. Do you understand what the metronome is in American music? Super, the thing that uh, clicks off, right? Well, that's what clave is in Latin music. Clave is it's two little meaningless little sticks to everyone that, that don't know about clave. Is that one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Most great Latin musicians are dancers in their heart. You feel it. You don't have to be a musician. The clave is something that you feel. The clave is a, is a pattern that you have to follow to arrange Latin music. And it's a two-bar figure. And that's the guy to do an arrangement and to write songs. It's got to stay in clave. It's our metronome. If you don't have clave and the clave is wrong, you better die and be born again. Or don't get involved with music because I can't even watch anybody playing out of clave because it'll throw me off, see? Tito was a, a child prodigy of Spanish Harlem already at the age of 13. Tito had a gift already, especially with the drums. I have pictures of Tito playing when he was 16 with Ramon Olivero. And they had never seen a drummer play drums the way he did. It's a possibility he did play younger, but he had to be home. There was a curfew. He was still a child. And Tito was to tell the story that they would tie his leg to the, to the bass drum because he was, he was short and he was tired and sometimes he would fall asleep. He was a young whippersnapper. What are you going to do, you know? One of the first bands he worked with uh, was Nora Morales' band. And then uh, he also worked with Machito's band as a percussionist. And I think what happened was he, he was a percussionist on the New York scene, uh, looking to do the latest, as always. Most of the drummers were playing in the back. They told Tito, come up to the front, because Tito was a show. And they had drafted the drummer of uh, the Machito band in 1941. And uh, Tito took over his part. And naturally, Tito got drafted. served on the USS Santee uh, in World War II. Tito was funny about certain things. He never wanted to talk about the war. Musically, what happened to Tito in the Navy, he was already learning how to play sax. He made arrangers from Glenn Miller's band, from Charlie Spivak, Marty Shore, different arrangers that were all serving in, in the war. And they taught Tito how to arrange. He comes home and uses the GI Bill and goes to Juilliard and learns composition and arrangements in Juilliard. From what I understand, he goes back to the Machito band. Under the law, you guaranteed a job. The government says you guaranteed the same job. But it turns out that Uba Nieto had six kids. And Machito tells him, Tito, you don't have no kids. This guy's got six kids. I can't fire him. So he went on to other things. Already Tito was arranging. And from what I understand, Spanish Harlem and in Latin music, the word got out that Tito, you wanted an arranger? This was the guy. I know he arranged and played with Pupi Campo and, and with, uh, with Jose Cubello also. And then went on and broke out, you know, broke, broke out and did his own thing. And in 1948, Tito started his own little conjunto. And he took half of Pupi Campos back with him. Jimmy Fisora, Joe Loco, and all of these guys. Tito Puente is a musical director, but he's a percussionist, and he's both. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there are few percussionists who are musical directors. And there are very few drummers that can take musical solos. And he could do that with just two drums. 
my favorite pieces of music, his the pieces he recorded in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, they recorded live. I love listening to him, especially when he was his 20s and 30s, when he was just so fast. It really captured uh, his spirit and his essence. November 23rd, 1949, Tito Puente recorded his first international major hit, which was called Ran Can Can. The war is over. Japan surrendered. Americans all over celebrate. This is the ending of the war. Everybody's coming home. It's happy time. Ah, it's a happy time. Because everybody has worked for the war, they've made their money on the side, and other money, and they're dying to spend it and have a good time. And that's just what it was. The Sunday that it opened, they opened up with Machito. <laughs> Can you get any better? Machito and if our Afro-Cubans were the first band like to really go to the Palladium and bring the uptown beat and dancing style downtown to Broadway. They had to close off 53rd, 54th Street on Broadway and 7th Avenue because of the line double around the block of all these people. This place, every Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the Palladium was, was, became the mecca of Latino music. Lots of great dancing. The dancing was just as exciting as the music. I used to love to just uh, memorize my parts so I could just watch the dancers. Oh, Cuban Pete, yeah. Mr. Lucilems, yeah, great, great dancer. Cuban Pete and Millie. <laughs> Played it was swing time. I mean, major stars used to go there, and it was the place to be, to be seen at. Wednesday night was like Broadway show business people, people that were appearing in plays or, or musicals on Broadway. And then uh, Friday nights, we'd get a lot of uh, Brooklyn, Bronx, Italian Americans, uh, Jewish American girls and boys dancing there, and they'd intermingle with the Latinos and the blacks, and the, the whole thing was the dancing. Dancing put everybody together. My mom and dad met at the Palladium in the late 50s. Tito was somebody that they listened to and is part of their kind of like uh, um, romantic courtship phase in their life. The Palladium now was the home. We could come from Spanish Harlem mostly Spanish Harlem, and go, go see our people play. It was the first venue where the sons of immigrants came to dance, and oftentimes they were not dancing the music of their fathers. It was hard to get in there, and you had to earn your way in there. To play at the Palladium, you had to be good. Machito, Tito Puente, and my father were the three top bands during the, the 50s and 60s. And it was a tremendous rivalry between the three of them. It was a positive kind of rivalry. It wasn't, it wasn't any animosity there. Machito played something, and, and everybody's sweating. They say, wow, that was some set. And Puente comes on, and you forgot what Machito played. And then after my Tito finished, then Tito Rodriguez come on. You forgot what the both of them played in. It was a constant, constant thing. My parents couldn't stand that music. I mean, they, they just couldn't stand it. You know, it was, uh, what happened to the Lelo Lai? What happened to M Vals? You know, what are you dancing that for? The greatest rivalry that ever was was the two Titos. Whenever the two of them played opposite each other, they worked so hard to outdo each other. Uh, one number, if they fail in one number, they will flip. But each number, they drew you out on the floor to dance. Bolero, seo lo que sea. Lo que sea. They drew you out to the floor. That was what was beautiful about the, the, the rivalry between Tito Rodriguez and Tito Puente. Each day they sounded better. 
basically, you know, a lot has been said that, um, that, that Tito and my dad were, were, you know, bad rivalries and everything. And a lot of it was, I think, was uh, uh, fabricated through the promoters. You know, the promoters caused a lot of, a lot of tension between the two. But my dad had the utmost respect for Tito Puente uh, as a musician and as a, as a person. I mean, they were friends. Tito was the most exciting because of his timbales. There was nobody that could do that. To, to this day, there are very few guys that can play like Tito. Just to see him uh, get on the stage, you can see like uh, he lights up the place. intimidating. I'd been a musician as a kid for years and I was a professional drummer as a kid but, but it was very intimidating to meet a giant and actually to, to be expected in a few weeks to get on screen with him. If you look at the great Latin craze today, the Latin uh, craze in dance and jazz, the origins go back to the gene pool of Tito Puente. He was the founding father of, of, of what we all do. He was the face, he was the name, he was the one who took all the hits in the beginning. The music really hasn't changed all that much. I mean, it has a little bit, but the roots of the African rhythms are there. Um, I think that both orchestras were very much ahead of their time musically. I mean, if you listen to the music that they both recorded, it, it just uh, it withstood the, the test of time. Tito Puente, until the day he died, played mambos. That was it. He never stopped playing the music that he played from the 40s, ever. What crazy nights they were in them days. Jesus. Talk about fun, eh? Hey, there'll never be days like that. The place in Nice is jammed. There are uh, 3,500 seats. There's 4,000 Anglo people with about three Nigerians. Tito Puente is the only person featured on this night. They know him. They love him. He is there. He can't wait to get on. They play the people immediately. These are people you look at, you know, sort of like when you think of French people, you think, you know, like that. Uh, when you think of the English, you know, you know, when you think of the Germans, you think, you know, he busts it wide open. Bam! Ba ba ba! Whatever, your notes you want to put with that. And they're not sitting anymore. Now, the funniest thing about it is they don't really know the dance. You know, they don't know, they don't even know elbow. You know, they jump. Ah, oh, they just jump in. Just <laughs> jump in. And, they, you know, and the, the women are just slinging hair, you know, they're slinging hair and the men are jumping. So, I mean, it hits the bone. You know, I'll see him like six months will pass and and, and you know, I'll see him. I say, so where you've been? Where, where, where have you? And he'll talk about the tours in Japan and Europe, and 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 and, and always with some kind of like uh, like a, a humble kind of self-effacing humor until you talk to some of the band members, and and they and they go, man, they, Japan was like off the hook, people all over the place. Uh, you know, when you're a kid and you go to school, you have geography books. You study geography, you see all these places, Indonesia, you see. Uh, China, you see Japan, and you know, you're eight or nine years old in the second grade, and you say, wow, look at all these places. Well, we went to those places. Tito didn't know how popular he was. You know, he was shocked, we were shocked at the turnouts, at the response, you know, that he got, at the knowledge people had of him, of guys in his band. Even when the Anglo population wouldn't accept the Hispanic population in New York, 
Tito's music was like a universal translator. Hi, hi, this is Elmo's friend Tito Puente. Yeah, 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 and this is his instrument that Tito plays right here. It's called uh, oh, oh, uh these are uh, timbales, Elmo, oh. and we also call them timbalon. Oh yeah, it's called a tim. Timbalon, timbalon. And don't worry, Elmo, I'm going to play a song now. Uh -huh. And by the time I'm through, yeah. I have the feeling you'll never forget what it's called again. Good. <laughs> He didn't know that he was a, a part of the fabric of Americana. Uh, Tito Puente is a household name in the United States, and not just with Latinos, but he crosses over. And I'll give you an example of that. I, I took him to the White House, and we were in a reception with President Clinton. And when President Clinton came over to Tito, Tito stuck his hand out and said, my name is Tito Puente. And the, President Clinton started laughing. And he looked at him and says, Tito, I know who you are. Puente takes the streets of New York and takes the, the barrios of Puerto Rico and he puts it into music but he brings it to a higher level. His music was something that you could listen to if you came from Belgium or England or Africa, especially from Africa, the Caribbean. Uh, you heard that music and you, it was something, hey, I, I can relate to this. So you don't get to be Tito Puente without making people feel. <laughs> In 1977, you two got together on the same stage, not at the same time, but on the same stage. What was that evening like? Well, that evening uh, exposed the music uh, to a lot of people, like Santana's type of music is Latin rock. Mm -hmm. And I played the same tune, which is Oye Como Va, in our own Latin uh, style. And uh, I seemed to gain his audience, and, uh, and his audience uh, liked the way I did it. So the rendition is good because I'm the composer anyway. Carlos Santana redoing his tune, Dad got into a whole new wave of rock music. Tito did the song in 1962, 63, on an album called El Rey Bravo. That was the original version. It didn't make any noise. Ten years later, 1972, Carlos Santana records it. But it was a big hit for Santana. Tito minded at the beginning because people would say, play that Santana tune. And Tito said, that's not Santana, that's my tune. Until he started getting these royalty checks. I think I feel him when I'm on stage now. I feel, I feel the Espirito de Tito Puente with me. I love him and I miss him very much. He would have been very, very proud to see his children not only perform with, with his orchestra, but he also would have been proud because he saw the community as a whole come together. I grew up in a body. I came out of an orphanage to live on 111th Street between Park and Lexington. Tito Puente tutored me, that's right, because I didn't know anything. Tito taught me things. The Pete, you can get it, work at it. Pete, you can get it, work at it. You need to be on clave, people. My man, my man, Pete, you can get it. You're not going to get it overnight. And I hit the clave correctly that night, and I said, I got it! And he knew. It's about time somebody taught our young ones. But I'm leading up. Okay, notice what I just did, fellas? I, I, you walk straight I know what my music is. is. You're coming to me? That's right. They should know it also. She's doing exactly <laughs> what I want. You, you know Tito it? always ah. felt that dance was an integral part of the culture. So he established a scholarship fund to support young dancers and musicians. The side street kids are here today, thanks to Tito. I'm a dancer, and I love dancing, and dancing goes with music the same. If you don't have the dancing, you don't have the music. If you don't have the music, you don't have the dancing. Why shouldn't they know their own music? 
master that and it leads to everything. Not only in the music, dance too. And I emulated him and I studied all his cuts, the parts, anything that was, was him, uh, I, I played. To be compared to him is an honor, but in some ways unfair. He's somebody who dedicated his life and he was the best at what he did. My grandfather always gave us a piece of advice. Uh, he gave us two pieces of advice that I, I've always kept with me. Number one, uh, it doesn't really mean anything unless you're nervous. And two, always be ready. Well, it was something to see his granddaughter perform. There was absolutely no anticipation of playing that day. It was um, an unexpected surprise. I, I have never played with my grandfather's band and, and never really expected to. I can remember him uh, spending time with me, going to a, like a Howard Johnson's on Bruckner Boulevard to take me for ice cream and stuff. And it was. Uh, Always a commotion. It was never peace. Uh, very rarely did we really have any quiet time, and that time was probably when we were at home uh, with mom or with uh, Grandma Celia, my dad's mom. Well, we would sit down and talk and uh, play the piano or talk about music and talk about school. I heard his recordings. I was a young boy, and I put it on a hi-fi, or la vitrola, as it was known in those days. And I, 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 I just, I couldn't understand at first that that's actually my father on that recording. I know the exact moment I realized how famous he was. It was uh, at a Menudo concert. It was my father, my mother, and I, and my brother. And uh, my dad brought us backstage, you know, met Menudo, everything. And I was a big Menudo fan. And when we went into the audience before the show started, people were coming up to dad, like, just, oh my God, you know, we wanted autographs. Just hysteria was coming out of the audience for my father. And we needed a bodyguard to come clear everyone away and actually stand with us through the show. And I was there excited about Menudo. I'm thinking, why is everyone bothering him? And I started realizing, oh my God, people really like, he's really famous. Because <laughs> here we are at Menudo, and I'm thinking they're, you know, world famous <laughs> at the moment. And I'm realizing that my father seems to be bigger than they are. I never saw him in that light. That's why I kind of looked at him as like, dad, or dad. And I was like, why are these people swooning over this man? <laughs> because he was just like, almost like a father to all Latinos and generations, or young and old. Think about, you know, the mid-1980s, being in middle school, and having your grandfather star on The Cosby Show, or being in college in the early 90s and having your grandfather be a suspect on The Simpsons and Who Shot Mr. Burns, or watching him play at the closing ceremonies of the 1996 Olympics. Today's high in Central Park made it up to 66 degrees. That's about 10 degrees below normal for this time of year. And our overnight low this morning was 54 degrees. I kept it quiet that I was his daughter. I mean, people knew, or people would find out, or they'd hear the name and try to make the connection, but I never publicly announced coming here to NBC that I was his daughter. But now, people know, but it's okay because uh, Every day someone stops me on the street, every, I mean every single day, someone stops me on the street to tell me a story about how they met my dad somewhere, they saw him, or they went on, you know, they went on their first date with their wife or husband, they saw my dad in concert, and things like that, and I'm happy because it makes me feel like I know more about him. The music is there, the, the love is still there, the admiration, it's like almost as if like he's still around, which I guess he is in a way through his music, at least that's the way I feel about it. My heart has always been in Puerto Rico. <laughs> my parents are from here, San Germán, Juan Adilla. Part of my family still lives in Ponce, and uh, I've been coming here a lot. No estar allí acompañándolo. Oh, gracias, gracias, amigo, gracias. Que tengan buena tarde. Gracias. That's nice. I feel it. I feel the, the beautiful vibrations of the people here towards me, you know. It's, it's home, it's really family. It, it touches me, really, and uh, I'm very proud.
I'm the guy. Yeah. I'm the guy. You're the guy. Okay. Well, this particular trip, Puerto Rico, it's the first time uh, that at least I am performing with the Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> She has the, the part, I have to ask her. If we don't copy it, right? Now we have seven seats. The way I have it, I have my band in front of the symphony orchestra. And that causes for a lot of excitement for the symphony orchestra because they've never had this type of experience before. Neither have I. <laughs> All right, good, good. All right, so uh, the first time we play C, Rastavier. F1, then you play your G, then everything else should be okay. Everything else should be okay. I've been coached on this because I'm new at this. I'm a, I'm a street musician. I play for the people that dance. You know, I do concerts, I do jazz festivals, I do a lot of universities and all that, but I never did symphonic pop. La banda la sinfónica. Sinfónica. Eso llegó. That's how you're sinfónica. Sí. No, no, no. I feel that that music no, I do no, no. in the street, by putting it at, at a symphonic label, gives it a higher recognition around the world, and that's important for us. After Noche de Ronda, is that possible? Because it'll be, it'll be a vibe segment. Yeah, Instead of you going back and forth, yeah, well, let's play Noche de Ronda, Capaita Cristal, and Noro, and then we're done with that. And I represent more or less around the world, wherever we perform, I represent the Puerto Rican flag. Because when they, they see me, it, they look at me, they know I come from the United States, but they look at me as a Latino, naturally. So where are you from? Well, I ain't from Africa, baby. Were you from Brazil? No. Argentina? No. Colombia? No. You know what I mean? Country? Mexico? No. Puerto Rico? Yeah. He always is, um, in a joking kind of way, almost self-effacing and, and, and humble, like with, with humor. He always does it with humor. I want to get a chair from the university, so I asked him, well, where's the table, baby? <laughs> I don't know about those chairs. <laughs> when I get all these recognitions, all these... Uh, Awards, they represent Puerto Rico, really. You know, and I got the National Endowment of the Arts from the President of the United States. I want to get something here in Puerto Rico from the Senate. Where do you go from here? After the symphony orchestra. Who do you play for? You know, I mean, this is the biggest, the symphony or philharmonic orchestra. You're playing our music at the highest level representation of our music. The only place I got to go after this is to the moon <laughs> and play the music up there. <laughs> El sueño del maestro, Tito Puente y la Orquesta Sinfónica de Puerto Rico. This was his last performance on this planet.
I've never seen him that pumped up. And he was electrified. Okay, what they say in Spanish, incansable. He was, he was tireless. And, and I, I will forever miss being in SOBs or one of those clubs and hearing the murmurs of, hey, you know, Tito just got here, Tito's here. When he hits it, it's there. And that's what art is about. Inevitably, they would ask him if he would play, and I never heard him say no. In his later years in life, I don't think he did it for money or, or fame or recognition because he was already considered an icon even in the 70s. I think he did it more for the love of performing and making people smile and making them dance, which he always wanted to do. Tito Puente have left a legacy, like Dizzy Gillespie or, 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 or Duke Ellington. That, that music will, will live forever among us. His work had such an immense profound effect on so many Latin artists in the world and artists in general. He did what he wanted to do. Not many people do that. He did what he wanted to do. I would call him a generous person. He is part of who we are as a people. Uh, he's going to be one of the Latinos that history is always going to remember. We did live a full life. Tito was the best. The best as a friend and as a musician. He was one of the fellas. This is American music. It's also music of the Caribbean. It's also music of Africa and these people absolutely love it. He had a kind soul, he had a kind heart, he was down to earth. Excellent musician, and a great human being. A very funny guy. Good time. Tito! Ready? Tito, tell me what's so important about this trip, this particular trip to Puerto Rico. Well, this particular trip to Puerto Rico, it's the first time uh, that at least I am performing with the Puerto Rico Symphony Orchestra. Now, I don't know of any other band leader or, or timbalero or salsero, if you want to call them, that has done this before. There may be some coming up in the future. I know some vocalists have done them. They come alone. But the way I have it, I have my band in front of the symphony orchestra. And that causes for a lot of excitement for the symphony orchestra because they've never had this type of experience before. 
neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's new for both sides. I can, yes. I can only begin to imagine this has got to be a lot more work. I mean, yeah, it is. But the most important part about it, which I foresee, I, I've been coached on this because I'm new at this. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a street musician. I play for the people that dance. You know, I do concerts. I do jazz festivals. I do a lot of universities and all that. But I never did symphony, pop, what they call. But I feel that that music I do in the street, by putting it at a symphonic label, gives it a higher recognition around the world. And that's important for us. What's important for you? you I know that when you got off the plane, you uh -huh. sort of you were excited to be in Puerto Rico again. What does it do for you to come to Puerto Rico? Well, my heart has always been in Puerto Rico. My parents are from here, San Germán, Juan Aria. Part of my family still lives in Ponce. And uh, I've been coming here a lot. And I represent more or less around the world, wherever we perform, I represent the Puerto Rican flag. Because when they, they see me, it, they look at me, they know I come from the United States, but they look at me as a Latino, naturally. So where are you from? Well, I ain't from Africa, baby. Where are you from? Brazil? No. Argentina? No. Colombia? No. You know what I mean? Country? Mexico? No. Puerto Rico? Yeah. You know. <laughs> so that's, the, I more or less represent Puerto Rico when we play all this type of Latin music or Latin jazz around the world. You know, everywhere we go, fans come out of the woodworks, you know, on the sidewalks. Is there something different about the fans in Puerto Rico? It's your own people. They're very proud of you. You can see it yeah, on the faces. Yeah, yeah, I feel it. I feel the, be the beautiful vibrations of the people here towards me, you know. It's, it's home. It's really family. It, it touches me, really, and uh, I'm very proud. And I, I've done a lot of uh, representation. I just came from the Library of Congress, big recognition. Uh, for living legends. I thought they gave uh, medals to legends who died. <laughs> they know you're living with legends and damn. Okay, then I got one, uh, the Hall of Fame the other night too. But when I get all these recognitions, all these uh, awards, they represent Puerto Rico, really. You know, and I got the National Endowment of the Arts from the President of the United States. I'm gonna get something here in Puerto Rico from the Senate. I'm gonna get a chair from the university so I asked him, well, where's the table, baby? <laughs> I don't know about those chairs. <laughs> don't you give me a table with it? But all, all, all these type of recognitions sort of uh, makes our music bigger, at a bigger aspect, see, because our music was always considered uh, like street music. It never had no uh, uh, respect at a higher level musically, but it's getting there thanks to the young talent that's coming out of Puerto Rico and the United States. Good musicians, good, excellent dancers, vocalists, arrangers, instrumentalists. It's all getting together now, and that's very important. Okay. How are we feeling? How are we feeling? Good. 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 I see a little bit of the sun on the, sh on the get a couple inches closer. Okay. okay. One last thing, Chief. Is this, um, is this yet, this performance with the symphony, is this yet now another phase in Tito Puente's well, arsenal of music? Is this another yeah, chapter? Well, uh, well, I think it's the, the the highest chapter. Where do you go from here? After the symphony orchestra. Who do you play for, you know? I mean, this is the biggest, the symphony or philharmonic orchestra. You're playing our music at the highest level, the representation of our music. The only place I gotta go after this is to the moon. And <laughs> play the music up there. <laughs> All right. The roots of well, music, music you play. Well, the roots and the culture comes right from here. And we're here at the Plaza San Jose in Old San Juan. A lot of music came out of this area, naturally, and I was very fortunate through my parents, of course, to learn about the music. Listening to all those trios and bombas and planas when I was a young kid, which then naturally developed into the more of the mambo and the cha-cha and all that. But it's always good to know all kinds of music so you have a nice cultural foundation and then you can express that to higher higher uh, musical terms one of the things that you always talk about that makes tropical music caribbean music unique is el clave that's right rhythm explain to me what is what is clave well clave is two little meaningless little sticks to everyone that that don't know about clave is that one two three four five one two three four, five, or you can reverse that, four, five, one, two, three, 
four or five. That's the basic thing in a lot of our dance music, naturally, traditional dance music. And uh, when you have the clave, that's where you can expand your arrangements and your melodic concept and sonarios, especially for singers. La clave, very important. What happens if you don't have clave or clave is wrong? Well, if you don't have clave and the clave is wrong, you better die and be born again. Or don't get involved with music because I can't even watch anybody playing out of clave because it'll throw me off, see? So uh, it's very easy to learn. You feel it. You don't have to be a musician. The clave is something that you feel. One of our kings of the clave was Arsenio Rodriguez, and he was a blind man. But he had a wonderful clave, and any time he heard anything that disturbed him, he would holler right away and stop and fix it. Tell me about the importance of percussion. You are at the heart of percussion. That's right. What's the roots of the percussions and why is it so important in the music? Well, percussion, that's time, music, rhythm. Your heart has rhythm, everything has rhythm. All life, everything is rhythm in life. And percussion is the basic thing for our music. That's why people love our Latin American rhythms because they have that wonderful percussive feeling where they feel like dancing and enjoying themselves and be happy all the time. You know, it's not like playing an organ. How are you, see? Even the dogs feel the percussion. That's good. Mexican culture, the Brazilian culture, you have the Caribbean culture, all the islands in the Caribbean and all that. And culture of all kinds of music and rhythms are very important. And for you to understand the culture of all kinds of music from different countries. And that's what makes us exciting and makes the music, particularly the music that I play, exciting Latin popular music. The other piece of roots that's here in Puerto Rico is of course your parents are from Puerto Rico. This is where we're not from Puerto Rico, we wouldn't have, you know, obviously. Well in my household, when I was a very young kid, all you heard was trio records. A lot of trios, you know, trio San Juan, a whole lot of trios. Aha, all of them, you know. But then as years went by, and as I studied music, I became more into the instrumental part of the music. But, but always remembering those, those trios, they were beautiful, romantic, and rhythmic too at the time. But that was the basic culture of the music. Then you expand that to bigger things. You, um, you often call the music that you play originally street music. You still hear it? Uh, yes, I do because uh, the mass of people are in the streets and they love a, a good rhythmic type of music. Whether it be a mambo, a cha cha, what we play, even the merengue, anything like that. Anything that's rhythmic, people love that. So they call me a street musician. I used to be called that years ago because of the percussion that I played. So most of the percussion uh, instrumentalists were called street musicians. They take a banderea here, and there will, or the scratch of the widow, we call that, or the conga drum, chambale, or bongo. You will always consider a street musician, not like a flute player, violin player, or pianist that went to a conservatory music to study music. But nowadays, the percussion instruments are considered highly important in an orchestra. So you come full circle, you come from that street music, you, you know, study, been in conservatory and you're not playing with the symphony. Does it feel good to come full circle back to the street again? Well, yes. I never forgot the street because I'm a dancer and I love dancing. And dancing goes with music the same. If you don't have the dancing, you don't have the music. If you don't have the music, you don't have the dancing. See? But now the young people are beginning to see that. There's dancing to every kind of music and that's very important. And it comes from the street too. The people know learn how to dance. And once they learn how to dance, they feel the rhythm and they love the music. Perfect. Cut. Let's wrap for this locale. Let's slot that barbed wire and put the radio back on. Let me just get a shot, a wire shot of him just okay. sitting there the way he is. Okay. Anyway, just, just pick up the red cable so we don't see that.